special. It's amazing. It's tenacity. I am so proud. I am uh, very proud and very pleased to be introducing to you my roommate, my teammate, and my very dear friend, Ron Porbon, for induction into the Juniata College Sports Hall of Fame. Ron came to Juniata in late August of 1959 from Portage. He was the son of a coal miner. Ron had gone to Beaverdale High School, where he was a star shortstop and pitcher on the baseball team, an outstanding quarterback and defensive back on the football team, leading the Beaverdale team to an 18-1 record in his last two seasons. I can also add that he probably made the most important decision of his life while he was at Beaverdale High School. First day of his freshman year, he ran into this little blonde girl named Rita Petkosh. Rita became his wife, and she's been his wife for over 50 years. When Ron, when Ron came to Juniata, he was blessed by, with being a teammate of some of the most outstanding football players, but even more outstanding men who were members of the class of 1960. I'm talking about Bill and Jim Barrier, Bob Schwalenberg, Bo Solomon, Al Dungan, Luce Krause, Dean Helsel, Skip Olasic, Harry Long, and lots of great guys. They were not only wonderful football players, but they were like big brothers to the class of 1963 football players. Ron was blessed with a rifle arm as a football player, and was a good runner. And very quickly, Ron became the backup quarterback, uh, the gold team quarterback in those days, we called it, uh, for the football team. And Bob Schwallenberg had been the quarterback for 20 wins in a row going into his senior year. And the team was looking forward to another undefeated season. Schwalli broke his wrist in the lock haven scrimmage probably a week and a half before the season started. And Ron was promoted to being the quarterback. And Ron, as a 17-year-old, not very large quarterback, <clears throat> led the team to four wins in a row keeping the streak going until uh, our last game of our senior year when we lost to that team that's name will remain unmentionable right now. <laughs> the line was quarterback for the following three years, led Juniata for four years in a row in passing and the last three years in total offense. Back in those days though, for some of you young guys who are still here, we didn't have substitutes very often. We were uh, players who were playing defense and playing offense. So Ron played quarterback, Ron played safety, Ron ran, run back punts. And in our coach's scheme of things, because our freshman year, the punter was Al Dungan, who was about 6'3", 235 as a tackle, Ron had to take Al's place in the line while Al punted. Ron weighed about 150 pounds then. He likes to tell, and he told this story when we came for the uh, glory year celebration. He told all of the young guys in the room that when he came to Juniata, he was six foot. But he had been hit so many times, he was now down to five seven. <laughs> <laughs> so Ron was, a, was an amazing football player. But he was also a really excellent baseball player. Good fastball, he was a relief pitcher and a starting pitcher. He won two letters in baseball. One year he took off in baseball and participated in track, and he won the varsity letter in track. I'd like to tell you a whole lot of stories about Ron, but he would probably be embarrassed. But there were some games our senior year, and our senior year was really a, a kind of an amazing experience because our junior year, we only played a seven-game schedule, and we were three wins and four losses. Coach kind of forgot about recruiting, and so we were down our last game in college, our senior year, we had 29 people dressed. But the things I like to talk to you about are, the first was Hampton Institute. In our junior year, we played Hampton Institute up here, and they beat us, and boy, did they beat us, 31 to nothing, I think all of us were battered in Bruges. But our senior year, we went down to Hampton, and uh, 
We got off the bus, and we were going to stay at the Williamsburg Inn. And I remember Ron very clearly. There was a, a gentleman who was cutting roast beef for dinner. He had great big arms, great big muscles. Ron said, Can I borrow your arms for the game? <laughs> we won that game. I believe the score, well, I know the score, it was 27 to 6. The second game I would like to mention was the Indiana game. For some reason or other, we scheduled IUP. And we went down there to play, and uh, they beat us. Unfortunately, I think the score was 13-6 uh, or 14-6. But in that game, a couple of, uh, well, one really funny thing I thought happened. Somehow or other, we got the ball on our own one yard line. And then there was 99 yards to go to score a touchdown. We're in the huddle, Ron says, uh, right T, right half deep. I turned around and said, time out. Now, those of you who are football fans, you know that when you're passing from your one yard line, the chances are you're gonna get sacked for safety. Ron said, no, 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 don't call time out, Dave, we're okay. And he completed a 97 yard pass completion to Vince Valisetti, who was pulled down on the three yard line of IUP. That was another famous story. Vince would be here today, except he's suffering from a leg injury, probably suffered in the Indiana game. <laughs> Our favorite game our senior year was against Albright. Uh, Ron's son, Dan, who's with us today, went to Albright. And uh, I don't know why Ron ever let that happen. <laughs> but in the Albright game, Albright had beat us our freshman year 14 to nothing and broke the 27 game winning streak. Uh, and we saw grown men, guys that we idolized, crying in the locker room after that. Sophomore year, they beat us again. Junior year, they beat us again. We were bound and determined our senior year that that was going to be the end of that streak. And on the very first offensive play of the game for us, Vaughn comes up behind the center, half the center on the bottom, and a quarterback sneak and went 57 yards for a touchdown. And we beat all right that day. We were the late of that day. And then the last game of the senior year, we beat Westminster 18 to 13. They had beat us the previous year. But the reason why I want to bring up Westminster for you is that in the first half, Ron, he had played all those years. He'd been battered and bruised and knocked around by a couple of bigger guys. But in that game, Ron had his front teeth knocked out in the first half. It's halftime, Ron's sitting there picking out pieces of his teeth. And we go out and we play the second half, and Ron led us to an 18 to 13 victory. The degree of toughness that Ron displayed in that game and all throughout all those four years of playing safety, quarterback, running back punts, going down on punts, kickoffs, whatever. That kind of courage and that kind of strength that Ron got from playing ball here, got from growing up where he grew up, was for being manifested so clearly beginning in 1996. Ron was identified in 1996 having throat cancer. And he had radiation treatments and we were all worried for Ron. We were all pleased that he was funny. Then in 2000, unfortunately, uh, he came back and Ron had to have a laryngectomy. And, and we worried about Ron, but that was 15 or 16 years ago. And when I think of Ron, I think of him throwing passes. I think of him running the football. I think of him throwing the baseball. But most of all, I think of the courage and strength that he has shown all of his life. Ron was a biology teacher for over 30 years in Upper Marion. He has a master's degree in, in biology. Um, and he's a dear, dear friend that I am so proud and so pleased to present to you Ron Portman.
hundreds of times now and didn't know where I can't find it. So there I was, left it on the table. Um, I have to read with glasses nowadays, so excuse me, but I'm President Trelaw, Ray Joe, Coach Lunch, Caroline, and all the people who put this together. It was fantastic, and I'm so glad to see so many people show up for it. Uh, I'm honored to be here, believe me, and, um, Dave and I, of course, as he told you, way too much about me, um, that, um, we have been friends ever since we came here as freshmen at Junion and continued through the years. We've traveled together all over the place with our families, and it's really nice to have <coughs> lifelong friends from Juniata, but that's the way Juniata is. Um, I would like to congratulate Carly, Tom, and John, who I met for the first time last night, and I'm positive that they never saw me play, <laughs> and I know I've never seen them play, unfortunately, but I, I really admire what they've been able to do athletically and academically here at Juniata. When Coach Lance, sitting over there, called me several months ago about this, I was shocked. I, I asked him, are you kidding me? And he said, no, you're, you're in. And I said, well, here's the conditions. I'll accept it only on behalf of all my teammates as well, because if I go in there, they're going in there with me. That's exactly how I feel. I want to talk about how I, got, how I arrived here at Junior. It began in the 50s with my parents. My dad was a coal miner, as they mentioned, and um, They, they spent hours and hours with me, um, throwing the ball and so forth, and taking us to little league games as we have with all our sons and daughters with softball and so forth. And they didn't have a lot in those days. It was pretty rough in the 50s for those of us old enough to realize how, how tough times were. But they never missed and never said, no, we can't go. When I played Little League Baseball, which was three miles away, because we didn't have many facilities where we grew up, um, I met two of the best men ever. They were tremendous coaches, and they really knew the game, and we were very, very successful in Little League. We had gone to Williamsport before they had the World Series, and uh, we worked our way through the system and got up there, and played the game and you talk about a couple of us. We played nine innings against Campbell and it was 3-3 and our pitcher had gone all the way the day before and I had pitched two days before and so this team was pitching and we go into that game 3-3, get into ninth and they bring in our third baseman who hadn't thrown much. He walked the first three and beat the next guy, and we lost it. So I know a little bit about being stung at the very end. But life went on for us. Then, then I went to high school, and I had the, the best football coach ever. His name was Ron Gorgon, and in 1992, imagine now he was coaching in the early 50s. But in 1992, much like this, he was inducted into the Pennsylvania Sports Coaches Hall of Fame. And he was well ahead of his time. His offense was very simple, but very, very effective. He had had four undefeated teams in 10 years and at Beaver Dome. Tremendous man, and I owe a lot to him because he set the mold for the rest of us and the bar. Now in Juniata, 1959. I would keep you here an hour, but to tell you about the traveling, 
kind of like a lot of your but it would take you kind of to do that privately later. But I arrived here with Dave and eight others. We were 10, 10 freshmen. They dropped us off out here. And parents went home, one suitcase, and that was it. And what, what, a, what a beautiful time to come to Junietta at Dave's at Bill Barrier, Jim Barrier, and all those wonderful guys, and then all the guys that preceded them had built this tremendous tradition. And here we were from lowly freshmen. But we learned so much from them. They were mentors, first class. They were like our fathers. And I did want to say one thing about that story on uh, going in as, as a, as a um, quarterback, or as a freshman. I went into the auto a nervous wreck, much more nervous than I am now. And, <laughs> and our center, Frank Bronco, said these words to me, said, don't worry, Ron, they're not going to lay a finger on you. And you know what? They didn't. They were the best. That group of people, if you ever look at them up in the yearbook, you won't find better people than those people where they were unbelievable people. And that set the tone for us for the next four years. It was beautiful. Now, I'm going to just say this about our football teams in general for those four years. We were extremely proud and still are of the way we represented Junior of football. Believe me, we were a team in all of those young guys over there. And Coach Lonson said this probably a hundred times. There is no I in team. If there is, you're a losing team, let me tell you that. You have to be a team cohesive unit. And those 10 guys that came as freshmen, we were molded by those upperclassmen. And thus, we were able to perform quite well for the sophomore, junior, and senior year. We did pretty well, considering that we did not have we I forget about my voice here. We did not have big 240, 250 pounders. They put what we had. We may have averaged 175 in the line and 150 in the backfield. If you look in the program, I was 170. You know why? I told the person who was publishing it, don't you put 160 in there. I want them to know I'm pretty big. And I don't think that I put 170 in there. That was a lie. <laughs> now, I said pretty much what I had to about Judy Adam. I would just like to recognize the very important people in my life over here. I have my family, my sons, two of which, we have three, two of which are here, Daniel. Well, all right, we don't hold that against him anymore. <laughs> Gregory, Ethan, Judy Adam's dad. Very proud of me played baseball here. I talked him out of playing football. But our three grandsons, Max, Matthew, and Michael, my daughter in law, she's there next to Greg, Michelle, and then, and then we have uh, all my friends that play football with us at this time. I'll just read their names Dave, of course. Al Kowalski, Tom Kinjerski, you know, say it in SKY. <laughs> Barry Moore, Dr. Barry Moore, Mike Kalitsky, Big Spellis, and he can't be here because of his leg injury. And then we have some classmates, Ross Early. Liz Van Buren and Nancy Wager. Those are classmates of mine. I, I'm going to close by saying I am most grateful for the education that I received here at Juniata. And on behalf of all my teammates, I would like to thank them and thank you and especially the committee who saw fit to allow me to enter this prestigious group of people. Of people. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you. I would like to thank Juniata College, the athletic department, and the alumni office for recognizing the importance of college athletics, not just for the college, but also for the Huntington community. Living in Huntington area for over 20 years, Juniata Athletics provide some very special moments for myself and family. I would also like to take this time to commend the college for providing the inductees an opportunity to thank those individuals that have made a difference in their lives. The change in format is greatly appreciated. That's great. To the selection committee, outstanding work on the induction of Thomas Nutt Divine <laughs> to the Juniata College Sports Hall of Fame. Tom is here with Kim, his lovely wife of 30 years. Kim, you're taking heaven's glory been punched. <laughs> Along with Kim is their son Matt and daughter, daughter Kayla. Tom and Kim, what a beautiful family. The best way to describe Tom would be to say he was a free spirit. You never knew where he was going to be or where he would end up, most times in the wrong place. The same could be said when you traveled with Tom, but regardless where you landed, you had a great time and you were the last to leave. <laughs> if Tom had been a horse, we would have put him out of his misery on several occasions. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's Pittsburgh mentality, growing up with his brothers and sisters, or lessons taught from mom and dad, but he never knew when to yell uncle, never understood the word no, and never was content sitting on the sidelines as a spectator. In the summer of 1978, among 40 freshmen joining the Juniata football team, to other players, Tom went unnoticed. A knee injury forced him to redshirt that first year and continued to plague him for the next two years. However, injuries didn't always keep Tom off the field. Whether it's a drill practice, a scrimmage, or even a game, Tom would sneak onto the field. The next thing you would see or hear was Coach Rogish throwing him off the field. <laughs> Once the Pete had to take his helmet away from him just to keep him off the field, he would just walk, he'd run in and say, you're out. So I was one of those guys, I'd run out. And then Coach Rogish would go, Tom said he was in. He's not in, he can't even walk. <laughs> Again, most times he wasn't where he's supposed to be. <laughs> Things started to get much brighter following the 1980 football season. And for the first time in several years, Tom was getting healthy. Every once in a while you'd see a glimpse of an amazing athlete, whether stealing a pass on the basketball court or pinning the ball against the backboard, Tom was getting his legs back. And, and I will tell you, at age 21, you see things sometimes and, and you don't truly appreciate it. I can tell you now that of all the people I've ever met, watched on TV, whatever, Tommy had the best, or the, I guess the quickest three steps I've ever seen in the best hands. I mean, you could throw a 90 mile an hour football from here to there and he would catch it. I mean, I, that's the kind of athlete he is. And we, we, we talk about it all the time when we bring up nut, among other things, but we talk about that as well. So, good job. Tom's first three steps were amazing and he had great hands. In fact, he would have been an excellent receiver, but most times he was never where he's supposed to be. Now you're seeing a theme here. <laughs> Considering the 20 freshman football players enrolled at Juniata in 1978, and the fact that only 10 were still playing in the 81 season, is a testament to Tommy's tenacity and determination, especially when you consider his rough start. Tom's perseverance was rewarded in 1981, intercepting 12 passes, setting a new school record, and leading the league in the category. Tom was recognized by his teammates in 1981 by being named one of the captains for the 82 season. In 1982, he repeated as league leader in interceptions with 11 and repeated as a member of the All-MAC team. In fact, Mr. Devine was a 1982 MAC Player of the Year. At the time, Tommy's 25 career interceptions topped his brother Billy by one. 
who prior to Tom had the most in Juniata history. I had the pleasure of being Tom's teammate for four years, and with number 29 around, there was never a dull moment. However, that my senior year in the fall of 81, when Tom intercepted the 12 passes in nine games, I can tell you it was magical. Honest to Pete, he was everywhere. Again, most times not where he was supposed to be, but he was everywhere. Well, Tommy, today you're absolutely where you're supposed to be. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Thomas Devine, newest member of the Juniata College Sports Hall of Fame. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, by the way, everyone knows now, first ballot Hall of Famer, and really, you know, he's lying. He's the best natural athlete I've ever seen in my life. There's hands down. And I've played with a lot of really good players. I have a bunch of brothers who were tremendous athletes, but there's no question he was he was the best natural I've ever seen. Uh, you know, I got butterflies. And butterflies? I haven't felt butterflies in years. <laughs> um, so I might ask somebody, Jeff or Stevie Lack or somebody, probably just knock me off the stage. <laughs> and then I won't have them anymore. I can start playing. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, thanks, thanks to the Hall of Fame Selection Committee, uh, my family, my wife Kim, Matt, and Kayla. And uh, you see, I'm a bunch of friends. I've got brother in laws, I've got sister in laws, I've got guys I played football with in high school, in college. I got just, I, I have, I'm so fortunate. A man shouldn't be allowed to have that many close people in his life. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, congratulations to Carly, uh, Hard, Ron, and John. Or John hasn't spoke yet, but that's a hard act to follow <laughs> after them. Um, but the great, great athletes and great honor. Uh, and Jeff mentioned Donnie, he stole a little bit of my thunder, but uh, it wasn't a great start that you had. You know, my brother Bobby, who you know was graduating, and uh, Coach Rossi was planning on trying to trying to fill this void with maybe me coming up and playing. But uh, I did rip my knee out in American League Baseball in the July of before I was going to report, and I was in the doghouse from the minute I stepped on campus with Coach Rossi. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you, Coach Rossi. He's in heaven now, I'm sure too. Uh, but. I, I want to tell a quick story about Coach Rossi. Coach, you guys, some of the, some of you folks know him. He used to stand on top of the press box, you know, during games, and Coach Rowe would be on the sidelines. And uh, Jeff got that story story really, really close when he was talking about coming on the field because they told me I could, if I could, you know, knee press eight pounds, I could play in the JV game. So he used to, you guys know, the guys play, you guys know, you he'll. JV's go down for stretching, and then I was in there and I did it. And at the time, Dan Helms was our trainer, so I did it. And I don't know how I did it because I couldn't even really bend my knee all that far. And uh, so Dan says, I don't know, Tommy, that was you were you stretching, arching your back or doing something. And so I went down to the equipment manager who we affectionately named Balls because that's who he gave out balls and jerseys and stuff to people. <laughs> and so I said, Well, no man, uh, I need a jersey for the game. I'm playing JV game. And I put a helmet on, it just kind of went down and hid. And I did exactly what Jeff said. I, I, uh, I come out on the field after a kickoff, it's like the middle of the second quarter. And I come down, and you guys have played a lot. And you, you see, it just opens up, and the kids run right at me. And I absolutely tattooed them. And the ball went flying. Coach Ross is on the top of that press box saying, Coach, who was that? Who was that? <laughs> Rogue time like number 56. <laughs> who was that? And he's a coach, he's like, I don't know. <laughs> so I finally get to the sidelines, and uh, he's like, he's like, that's, that, what the heck are you doing out there? <laughs> and uh, so I got deeper in the doghouse. <laughs> I was so deep, he was slingshotting milk bones. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, you know, we talked about, and, and some of the folks that spoke before me talked about, um, yeah, it was tough. You know, I, I wanted, to, I really wanted to quit. Uh, you know, be before that time, because school was hard, as you guys know, the gals know, 
it was tough and uh, not playing football and, and they didn't want me around the field. I wanted to be on the field, just do anything, you know, throw the balls or do something. And it, he really didn't want me on the field. And so it was tough and I called my dad and my dad raised uh, eight kids and uh, six of us, all six of us played college football from NC State to Marshall to Juniata to Slippery Rock to, you know, so we all played. But, uh, my dad, I called him up and I said, Dad, I don't think this is for me. And you got to remember, my brother Bobby just graduated and was a great player. And uh, my dad loved you. And he, and he says, uh, I said, I want to quit. And he says, walk home. <laughs> I said, Dad, it's 100 miles from your own. He says, nah, you're wrong. It's about 120 miles. <laughs> <Click>. <laughs> We did get a coaching change. Uh, Coach Ash come in, and uh, and I, I, I really I wanted to play so bad. I I, I really worked hard in my in the off season with uh, some of my guys back here, Bobby Betts, uh, who played at Clary, and he was a wide receiver. Uh, and, and we I just worked hard. I really did, and, and I worked hard to get back on the field. And came to the following year, and um, you know got a good start on it. You know, I had in, in three, the first three games of the season, I had nine interceptions in three games. So it was like they were throwing the ball right to me, it seemed like. <laughs> but as, as everybody knows, who plays football or baseball or any team sport, you know, and it was mentioned before, you know, we had, we had a great defense. Our defensive line and our linebackers, they were, those guys were good. And a lot of times it, it was just Jeff, Jeff made fun of me for not being in the right spot. You know, I would, for me, I was looking for the ball. You know, I just, if the ball's in the air, I thought it was mine. It wasn't the receiver. It was mine. <laughs> so, but uh, Coach Rogan said, just keep doing it. Keep doing it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so it started out like that. And it was uh, it was one of those things I always thought that they were throwing away from Jeff Miles because he was on the other corner. So I figured, you know, they were trying to avoid him, so they were throwing it to my side. So it, it worked out okay for us. Uh, yeah, coaches, Coach Rogic, my teammates, you know, like it was said before, you know, individual words didn't mean much. It's never meant much to our family. Uh, in fact, my dad, you know, growing up and playing sports, we'd come home and he early on he would say, hey, uh, how'd you do? I said, oh, dad, I had, you know, two interceptions, block punt, this. He said, no, 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 no. How'd the team do? <laughs> and he did that with all of us at all times. So it kind of yes, it shows you what he thought about individual accomplishments. It was a, it was always about the team, always about the team. Uh, speaking, of my parents, uh, they're in heaven now, and uh, my dad loved my mom. My mom, they loved Junior. Because uh, when they used to go down to NC State, Marshall, they never saw my brothers. Like they they'd go in Thursday. And they'd see him for five minutes, and then they'd be staying at the hotel, and it was it was big time football. And they would see him a little bit after the game on on uh, on Saturday. You know, here I come up after after specialties. I'll be up here talking to my dad 15 minutes before the game, talking to him. Hey, how you doing? Hey, good. How you feeling? Like that. And he loved that. He loved that fact. And I'm sorry, guys. You know, my brothers, if you're listening to ones that couldn't come. If you're listening on the, the WebEx or whatever, you know, he liked Juniata better than the state. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, so my time, my time is up. Uh, thank you again for this prestigious award. I'm, I'm proud, I'm very humbled, and I'm honored to, to have my plaque next to some of the great athletes and key contributors in, in Juniata College uh, athletics history. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's such an honor for Heather and me to introduce Carly Dale for her induction, most deserved induction into the Indiana College Sports Hall of Fame. Before I turn Carly's introduction over to, to Heather, I want to do two things. You know, number one, of course, is to talk about Muddy Run. And if, um, if any of you remember back in 
19, the 1992 spring, we had an ap apocalyptic rainstorm and Muddy Run overflowed and it was covering the entire baseball field. And sometime during that day, I went down to Sheets and with the people who drank coffee down there, was talking about the Muddy Run turning into a river and they called that apocalyptic rainstorm a 100 year event. And for Heather and me, Heather and me coaching, having the privilege and honor of coaching Carly Dale Blair was a 100 year event. 100 year, uh, once in a lifetime opportunity to coach somebody who was a terrific athlete, beyond a doubt, uh, amazing athlete, but even more than that, a spectacular leader and an even better human being. I'll go through a very short biography, a very short resume for Kylie and everything that she did while at, while at Juniata. She came to us from Cochranton High School in, uh, what that, what's that county, Carly? Crawford County. That's Crawford County. Okay, they, the French Creek Valley League. That is uh, terrific athletics, terrific volleyball for, for sure. And she was an all-stater at Cochranton came to Juniata and proceeded to uh, uh, accomplish even more. She was a winner of the Bargerstock Award in a graduate year 2005. That's uh, for the outstanding female, female athlete at Juniata. She became the all-time assist leader uh, and beating out you know, probably the, the other greatest player ever coach, Heather Blau Pavlik. She was a four-time first team all-conference honoree. She was the Conference Player of the Year in 2003-2004. She's the NCAA Regional Rookie of the Year, Freshman of the Year in 2001. She's a first team All-America selection in 2003-2004. She was the NCAA National Player of the Year. And that comprises uh, a group of athletes, probably 4,000 athletes in all of NCAA Division III volleyball in 2004 and she was the uh, COSIDA, what's COSIDA? The Co College Sports Information Directors of America. And they take care of the academic All-America stuff. And Carly was the COSIDA, COSIDA Academic All-America of the Year in 2004. And what that means is that's all divisions, divisions one, two, and three. And that's an ESPN award and Carly was named and honored as the COSIDA ESPN Academic All-America of the Year in 2004, along with Alex Smith, and Alex Smith is currently the quarterback for the Chiefs, Kansas, Kansas City Chiefs. San Francisco never should have traded him away. And Carly represented all women, all divisions, all sports, while Alex Smith represented the men on that side. It's such an honor for me to introduce, help introduce Carly into the Sports Hall of Fame. She's just special, and Heather will tell you a little bit more why. So I just want to start out by saying that um, thinking about how Carly ended up here, uh, Larry and I had seen her quite a few times at camp. Once was. Uh, Legendary high school coach uh, Bob Miller was so impressed with her at camp that he basically told us we had to get her. And he was right. We happened to have her on campus here for a day and found out she had a, a basketball game that same evening. So after she drove down here to see us, we decided to turn around that night. Two of us agreed, let's get in the car and go. We want this one. To this day, I'll say it's the best trip I've ever taken. It was the smartest trip I've ever taken uh, because we did get her. We did get her right after that. And uh, it pretty much changed everything. We, we had always had a great program, had great teams. Um, but you need that special person to make it all come together. And uh, I think Carly was that. Uh, she didn't, it didn't necessarily happen in the easiest of ways all the time. Uh, we all know that people who are successful tend to um, figure out ways to make bad situations into good situations, and that is something that she absolutely had done. 
and I'm sure still does to this day. That's why she's successful. Uh, there's probably not any player I'm more proud of than Carly in all the years I've coached, and I know Larry probably feels the same, um, for so many different reasons. To me, she's the quintessential Juniata women's volleyball player because she was not only a great player that was given a lot of great abilities uh, from her parents, thank you, uh, but she used them to the best of her ability. She was a fantastic worker, a great leader. Um, she was tough, really tough, mentally tough. Uh, she could overcome things that set her back. You know, Larry spoke of all her awards. Uh, she was also a great student. She used her abilities to be great not only in our gym, but also in the classroom. And for that, she laid the groundwork for all the players who came after her. When I recruit someone to this day, I say that this is a place where you can come and you can excel in both the classroom and on the floor. She's the quintessential person to look at for that kind of a role model. So she's still affecting our program to this day in so many different ways. Um, she overcame a lot of adversity from freshman to sophomore to junior and senior. Um, I think you know the obvious one to look at is there was a lot of adversity in her senior year, but uh, Carly remembers a conversation she and I had in, in my old office as a freshman when I think she expected to come in and be able to learn for a year, and uh, all of a sudden she found herself having to start as a freshman with a very, very successful team. Um, she was definitely nervous and uh, she was worried. She handled it beautifully, as she always did. She grew into the position, became really good at what she did. Uh, the next couple years were, were pretty successful. Uh, we got dealt a really nasty blow when she was a junior. We were ranked very, very high all year long. Uh, had beaten a team here in gym in three. Had to turn around and go to their gym a couple weeks later to play in a national quarterfinal. We were not good. Uh, we lost a heartbreaker, undefeated at that point, and lose before we even make it to the championship round. That's a hard blow to deal with for a team uh, who had such high expectations. I think that spring was sort of her defining moment. We went back into the gym in the spring. How do you handle this? So much disappointment. You would work so hard. Things didn't go your way. Uh, she sort of group, got the group together, never let them have a bad day of practice. Uh, people would come in and not be great. Carly was immediately in the middle of it saying, I'm sorry, that's unacceptable, we've gotta do better. Uh, she pushed really hard that spring. Thought we had a great group going into the next fall, which would have been her senior year, 2004. Thought we're ready for this. We had landed one of the best outside hitters in the entire state. And uh, really looking forward to meshing her with the group we already had. We thought, yeah, we can do this. Um, got dealt another nasty blow. Uh, that player <coughs> happened to be Erin Dodson. Uh, found out during our very first week of competition, um, she had a brain tumor. So all of a sudden, we're thrust into this position where <coughs> all of these hopes and dreams are, <coughs> are sitting there, and we've got something much more important to deal with now. All of a sudden, we've got this uh, for us a player, for them a teammate, who's in the hospital fighting for her life. And you know, Larry and I were really overwhelmed with everything, trying to think, how do we keep this group together? How do we do this? The answer was sitting right there. Um, we often talk about players who are coaches on the floor, or coaches for us in the gym, an extension of our staff. She was every bit that and more. Uh, we never make it through that fall without her leadership and keeping the group focused and together and continuing to make them understand what we can do for Erin right now is be really strong and be great. And cause that's what she would want. Uh, and she did that. And to me, uh, that's the most impressive thing I think I've ever seen in the athletic arena that I've been aimed so close that I could touch it, was the ability of that group to hang in there, uh, overcome everything, and win the national championship with Erin sitting behind us watching the entire time uh, was one of the best moments I've ever experienced in my entire life. Uh, definitely not possible without Carly doing an amazing job of overcoming adversity, hanging in there, being tough, being supportive for her team. Um, so that's the kind of person we have here. You know, it goes beyond being a great player, uh, goes beyond her God-given abilities. This is a person that takes a situation that could be disastrous and turns it in our favor just by her sheer, sheer will to succeed. 
Um, so that is what I always look at when I see when I see Carly. Um, and I absolutely use her as a role model for our team. Someone that has played and understands what they're going through at every moment uh, and more. So for that, I just want to say to Carly, thank you so very much uh, for being everything we could ever hope to have a Juniata women's volleyball player be. I uh, speak often um, for my job without these, but today I wasn't so sure that I could go without them, so I have these today. Um, they give me way too much credit. <laughs> you know how you know the tail of something grows year after year. Well, I think that's what, what's happened here. Um, the, the legend of Carly grows with each passing year that she's gone. Um, but as anyone in attendance last night, the, the men's match would have seen um, the, that the men's volleyball match when the four inductees were, were announced, um, the discomfort level was extremely high as I stood in the middle of the gymnasium floor while um, they talk, read my list of things that, that was up there. Um, and it's not because I don't like being in front of people. I, I mean, I played how many matches in front of how many different people throughout all the years. Or I don't like speaking in front of people because I, I do that just fine. Um, it's just the individual recognition that really makes me nervous and makes me, makes me uncomfortable because really everything that I've accomplished has been accomplished because of the great teams that I've been on. There's not any of those awards that I would have received if he had been on a bad team. Um, so all of that is really just a credit to the great coaches and the great teams that, that we've had, uh, that I've been a part of. Um, just after the, the Hall of Fame class was announced and there was a, um, an article on the website about it, I, within hours, one of my um, beloved, excited, and very proud teammates shared it on Facebook, the largest social network in the entire world, in which I had hoped to avoid, but didn't last more than a couple hours, and she had to, to um, share that with everyone. Thank you, Katie. Um, but the next day at work, one of my coworkers said, well, I saw that, that on Facebook. That's really neat. You know, congratulations. And, People that I work with, I've been have been with the same company since I graduated, and I did an internship there, so they they were aware of what I accomplished here. Um, but he said, you know, you, you really don't talk about it very much. Um, I said, well, I said it's really hard for me to talk about. I said I talk about it with my family, and when I get back together with my friends and my teammates and my coaches, and that's really fun to to talk about old times, but it's really hard for me to talk about it with people who didn't live it with me and people who don't understand or maybe didn't have similar experiences in what they have done. Um, just that that level of understanding of, of what it means. It's not just, didn't just play volleyball for a couple of years, you know, I went to college, it was so much more than that. And understanding the family um, that you gain and the relationships that you form while you're here, it's, it's just really hard to describe. So every chance I get to come back here or to see those people or um, to talk about things with people who have shared similar experiences is really, really neat for me um, because they don't always get to, don't always get to do that. Um, you know, we it's really, I mean, Heather kind of stole some of my thunder there, but we really, I'm still waiting for ESPN to call um, with the, their next 30 for 30 series, 30 for 30 for the 30 for 30 series. They do these documentaries on teams, and because our, our um, from the end of the 2003 season when we lost unexpectedly, Heather downplayed it. We were ranked first and undefeated and lost in the quarterfinals. It wasn't exactly fun um, to winning the national championship a year later. And the ups and downs, you know, you couldn't have written a better movie <laughs> really with, with what had happened. Um, and, you know, I watched, uh, I think another 30 for 30 reference 
I, I watched one on um, Jimmy V, the, the 1983 NC State Wolf Pack that um, created March Madness, right? They were the eight or nine seed that end up winning it all. And um, Terry Gannon, who was a member of that team, said they had, they had brought all these teammates back to talk about their experience and their coach, who obviously is no longer um, with us. And towards the end, Terry Gannon said, you know, I just don't talk about it a lot because no one really understands what it was. And in watching that, I, I understood what he was talking about, that um, a lot of what we experienced um, is, is hard to share. Um, and so many, so many people here talk about their relationships that I formed here. And they, they do, they, they were so nice to me and making it seem like it was all me who, who did all this stuff. But really, it was a lot of the people here that helped me to be that person. Um, Coach Smith um, took me from a, helped me improve my 75-pound uh, incline bench score from a whopping zero my freshman year. It's zero. He had to help me get the bar off of my chest <laughs> during testing to um, over 40 my senior year. A lot of the, the soft-spoken, um, that's great, Carly's, helped a lot along the way in four years. Um, Jeff Lydit kept my left hand from falling off at the wrist until I could have surgery. Um, after my senior year with his innovative taping techniques. Um, all my, my professors uh, here, and um, Don Peruso and Jim Donaldson here, who are um, great support academically here. Um, I formed great relationships with them, my advisors and my professors over the years. And you know, when I was deciding where I wanted to go, it was either well, Penn State or Juniata. And obviously, they were two very different different schools. Um, and I obviously know that I made the right decision, um, and both athletically and academically. Um, I was able to, to work with them and build relationships with them. Um, in the words of uh, Professor Donaldson, unlike, I'm sure, what I would have experienced at Big Blue over the mountain, as he has referred to it before. Um, my teammates, uh, the older ones who helped to, me to learn what it was like um, or what it should be like to be a part of the Juniata Volleyball Program. Um, my younger teammates who challenged my leadership skills and who allowed me to pass on the knowledge of what it's like, uh, what it should be like to be a part of the Juniata Volleyball Program. And um, my teammates who are in my same class, uh, Lindsay Abel Fraley, who's here today, is one of those who um, really just shared in all of that along the way. And finally, my coaches. The Carly that came here in 2001 was very different from the Carly that left. And that's largely due to that. They're very special people. And that's a large part of why I don't really talk a lot about my experience here with others because it's hard to describe who they are and what they did for me other than make me a better volleyball player. Um, not just a not just giving instruction on the floor, but developing people, um, take, taking kids and, and turning them into to grown adults um, who are able to thrive in the outside world. Um, and my family, who was there with me along the way, um, didn't miss very many games, didn't miss very many matches from the time I was this big. Um, until the time I was grown, um, without their support and encouragement, that, that, none of that would have ever happened either. So, thank you to the committee. Um, thank you to everyone here. Um, thank you. <laughs>
in four years here, I don't think I think I called you John more today than the four years you were here. So he will be henceforth referred to as Cruz. All right. <laughs> Um, I had the privilege of uh, coaching Cruz for four years, and uh, when I think back on it, he was probably the first really big, big time guy we got here. Um, first time I met him was at the high school meet at Holidays Park High School where he went. Um, I think Coach Gibney came down to see me at one point and said, hey, this guy, uh, he, uh, he's thinking about doing track and football. He's a 50 plus shot footer, uh, 150 foot discus thrower. Uh, you interested? I took about three quarters of a second and said, yep, and uh, off we went. We went to watch him throw. Um, I only saw him throw twice that year. The second time was at the state meet. Uh, he did not have the day he wanted. I don't think it was a, a horrendous day, but it was not the day he was looking for. He was looking for a really big time throw. Afterwards, I recall talking to his dad. We were walking away from the, uh, I think it was a shot put, and he said, uh, uh, you know, what can you do to help him get better? And I very vividly remember telling him, we got to get him the right shoes. He was wearing some uh, high top hiking boot kind of things that were completely flat on the bottom, not even the right footwear. And I was thinking, man, you're throwing this far. What can we do with you if you get the right stuff? Um, and then if you know anything about track, basically every discipline has its own shoes. There's like, if you're the decathlete, you can have like seven pairs of shoes going to a meet. You got to pack an extra bag. Um, but John didn't have any of these. Um, so he got him the right shoes and he went on to a very successful career here. Um, I know his, his bio mentions this, he did score 58 points at outdoor conference championships, uh, which is still fourth in the time I've been here, which is over 22 years. Um, for a thrower, that's an incredible amount. When you're talking about scoring 10 points for a win, and him really only throwing the shot and disc over the four years, it's amazing. Um, he didn't throw the jab, and uh, his senior year, we started to throw the hammer. Um, it had become a conference event his junior year, um, but re really, we didn't have any place to throw it here on campus. Um, I remember at one point, we had uh, taken barricades and blocked off places on College Avenue so people couldn't park, and we were literally throwing off the, off the asphalt of the street into the sand volleyball courts right off of College Ave. And uh, then I got in trouble for that. And, uh, <laughs> so we went, we went and bought a four by eight piece of plywood and we put that on Ellis Field in the grass, and uh, we, were, we started trying to throw that. And I really had no idea what I was doing. I was trying to learn on the fly. We didn't even have a glove at that point. We were throwing without gloves. And that's, that's, that, uh, that does a little damage to the hands. Um, I, wish, uh, I wish I knew then what I knew now in terms of a hammer, because that would have been a very good event for you. Um, track is different than other sports in that there's no, really, no real regular season uh, contest to decide a conference champion. Um, everything we do is settled on two to three days at the end of the season at a conference championship. And everything we do is geared towards that. Um, along the way, there's bigger meets where people try to qualify for nationals. We'll try to get in the top five uh, in terms of uh, junior history. Um, we'll go at massive PRs or something like that. Um, but regular meets essentially become glorified practice till that end. And everything you do, we, we try to put you in situ uh, situations where um, you gotta elevate your game a little bit. Um, John Cruzberger was one of the best I ever coached at embracing this philosophy. He placed in the discus in three of his four years. Um, his freshman year was, was frankly a disaster. Um, he, he finished 17th, he couldn't get one in the sector. Um, it, was, it was pretty disappointing, I think, for him more than us. Um, but he did improve in the conference every year. He finished fifth his sophomore year, finished third his junior year, finished second his sophomore year, or his senior year. Um, where he really excelled, though, was a shot. Um, that's where he really made his mark. He was a five-time conference champion um, in the shot put, finished his career unbeaten in MAC championships, four outdoor, one indoor. The only reason he didn't win more indoor is because his senior year was the first year we were a varsity program. Um, we had been going to the conference indoor meet for a little while, very loose, like they just let us come and the guys could compete. And I remember some of the guys we had got medals, or should have gotten medals, but we weren't a varsity program, so they gave them ribbons and even get medals, even if they were the top three. Um, so, um, the one time we did get to go, though, he did win. Think about that for a second, though. The five biggest meets of your life, and you are able to elevate your game every time. And I think there was something like 55 shot putters I looked at over the four years he competed against. And, and one poor guy from Widener, and actually he's from Widener, so I'm not to worry about it. But <laughs> he finished second three times to John. Um, and it wasn't easy. I, I remember one time on Messiah, I think it was his fifth throw, he was down, and he was down a lot, he was not having a good day. 
but he did find it, it he put it all together on one throw went from like third or fourth to first and basically you can see everybody just deflate right there because they knew that was it that was his row and it was over <clears throat> He was a true competitor and refused to be beaten by anyone in the MAC. They got him in the disc some, but not in the shot. Um, he had a great work ethic and not afraid to put in time of practice, which is probably, probably why he was so su successful. Sometimes he'd throw too much. Um, there are times he would actually leave himself a raw mark on the side of his neck where he would throw a shot, but it wouldn't stop him. You would bleed and whatever, just wipe it off, keep going. Next day, he'd be throwing again and just break it open. It's pretty impressive. His performance is still ranking the top five in Juniata history. In the outdoor shot put, he's third. Indoor shot put, he's still first, still only after one year. And uh, in the outdoor discus, he's fifth. I've been fortunate to coach four athletes that have won four consecutive championships in one event. Uh, it's extremely difficult to do. You're basically the target from day one. Um, and everyone's shooting at you for four years. Cruz was the first to do it. In some sports, things change over time. Uh, what was good 20 years ago doesn't compare today in, uh, in athletics. <clears throat> Records are made to be broken, but, uh, but sometimes uh, performances transcend time. I can tell you that his throws between 1998 and 2001 would still be very good. Um, if he were on our team right now, he would challenge for a discus and shot put championship every time. His competitors would know, as they did then, that they would have to throw their lifetime best to beat him, because you know he was bringing it at the conference meeting. It was a pleasure to coach at Cruz. Um, I still remember the high leg kick with the glide, um, the marks on the side of your neck from throwing, and, the, and that big old smile, whether you were throwing well, winning the meet, or just having some fun out there. Please congratulate me in joining, uh, or please join me in congratulating John Cruzberger for induction into Juniata College Sports Hall. Wow, I don't know how to follow that up. Uh, it really kind of brought me down memory lane. Uh, I, didn't really, I, I totally forgot about having the marks on the side of my neck, but now that he brings it up, it's like, wow, yeah, I really did. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, following all, all the fellow inductees today, everyone, you know, great performances over their career. Um, really proud to be at Junior. Um, so let me jump into it. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not very good at public speaking, so if I get a little nervous, I'm sorry. So. Um, Good afternoon, coaches, fellow honorees, families and guests. You know, I was both surprised and honored when I was notified that I was to receive this award. Um, track and field, football, um, going, I, all those different individual achievements when you're living in it, you don't necessarily think about what you're doing right then at that moment. But, you know, thinking about it now, 15 years later, it's like, wow, I really did all those things. That's, that's really cool. Um, but along with all that, it brings back memories of my uh, earlier life as a student athlete in this fine university. But more so, it brought back memories of my childhood. As a young boy, I was always interested in sports. I had played football, wrestling, and track and field during my junior and senior high, high years at Hollidaysburg area. I continued on to play football and track, uh, track and field several years at Juniata here as well. But my true sports passion was always shot put in discus in track and field. I used to practice religiously at my home with, with the shot put in discus uh, when away from the field. Um, I can remember putting many, and I mean many, holes in my dad's lawn on the shot put, um, as well as replacing shingles from the discus that would strike the house. Um, but uh, all my hard work paid off. I, I really think you get what you put into something, and I put a lot of work and uh, in, or on the field and off the field for all my sports, as well as my academics. You know, you have to put in the, the effort to, to go somewhere with it. Um, but after doing shot put in high school, I was given the opportunity to represent Juniata at their track meets. I received many accolades and won the max several years. But I attribute, attribute my dedication and work ethics for my track coach, John Cutter. He consistently involved, he was consistently involved in critiquing and helping me to better my throwing technique. Um, I also want to recognize Coach Doug Smith for helping me to become stronger, faster at what I did. Um, some of his uh, guidance that really helped me to develop physically. My experiences both academically and athletic here ultimately prepared me to enter the real world. I currently live in North Carolina and I'm married to my wife Jennifer, whom I met at this college. 
Um, we have two sons, Maxwell and John Paul III. Um, I currently enjoy my professional life as PetSmart store manager, working with both people and animals. Again, I want to thank this institution for this honorary presentation and express how thankful I'm here to receive it. I want to thank my parents for standing by me all these years. I want to thank my coaches and my fellow athletes as well. Thank you. God bless.